Okay, well, it looks like we've got people shuffling in, and in the interest of time, I'm going to kick off um, our, our webinar this morning. Good morning and welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us for today's Fundamentals in Healthcare Law webinar focused on regulation of hospitals. For those of you joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah, I hope you made it into your offices safely this morning. Um, we woke up to a lot of snow, and for those of you that didn't go into the office, you probably made the right call. But Anyway, thank you for joining us um, today. It's great to have all of you with us. Um, this is the fourth of 12 webinars in our Fundamentals of Healthcare Law curriculum. Our next webinar is scheduled on Wednesday, January 19th from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. And it will focus on HIPAA privacy and security. So more to come on that. Um, my name is Jason Castor, and I'm the Chief Business Development Officer for Parsons, Bailey & Latimer. And I, again, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for being with us uh, for today's presentation. Um, and thanks for taking um, time out of your busy schedule um, to be a part of this. Many of you have um, participated in many of our um, webinars to date. Um, so for those of you that are returning, thanks. And for those of you here that are here for the first time, welcome. Before I introduce our panel, I'd like to cover a couple of quick um, logistical or housekeeping items. First, today's webinar is being recorded and you will be provided a link via email to the recording to share with your colleagues and teams. Also, um, this email will include a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation. Second, we've allotted time at the end for Q&A, so please use the chat feature during today's webinar to submit your questions and we'll do our best to address your questions um, at the end of today's presentation. And finally, it's important to note that today's webinar or today's presentation is considered a general source of information and is not intended and will not serve as a substitute for legal counsel on these issues. You should not act upon the information provided without consulting legal counsel. So with our housekeeping aside, I'd now like to introduce today's panel and our speakers. Lee Radford is a shareholder in our firm's Idaho Falls office and is the chair of our corporate securities and tax department. Lee counsels his healthcare clients in a wide range of areas, including contracts, insurance, and employment matters. Lee, thanks for being with us. Kelsey Kirkham is an associate in the firm's Idaho Falls office as well. Her practice includes defending medical malpractice and licensure board disciplinary matters that involve physicians, hospitals, nurses, and other healthcare providers. Kelsey, thanks again for being with us. And last but certainly not least, Patrick Gallimoulame is an associate in the firm's Boise office and assists clients in the healthcare, technology, real estate, and manufacturing sectors. Pat, it's great to have you with us today as well. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Lee Radford, who is going to take us through the first section of today's presentation. Lee, I'll turn it to you. Very good, thank you, Jason. And it's great to be here with Patrick and Kelsey today uh, presenting on this topic. Uh, hospitals are interesting things. And sometimes I think we we think we understand what a hospital is, and uh, but we don't always. Uh, sometimes it can be a, a bit confusing to understand what a hospital is. So I wanted to start my presentation today just asking the basic question, having you think about what, what is a hospital? Um, what is a hospital after all? There's a lot of misconceptions about what a hospital is. And so I put out some of the definitions, a legal definition I put here is a place where medical services are performed, where ill and wounded people are received and treated, an institution for the reception and care of sick, wounded, infirmed, or aged persons. So that's pretty broad. That covers a lot of different facilities, um, some of which may not, we may not consider hospitals. So, but, you know, we get into more technical definitions of what a hospital is um, under, um, and I'm in Idaho, so I went to some of the Idaho rules and under CMS. So these two other two definitions I put out here is first of all, the Idaho rule. So Idaho has to have a very clear rule so they can really decide who they're regulating as hospitals and who, what kind of facilities they're regulating in other ways. Being a hospital, has a much heightened degree of regulation and, and discipline, compliance. Um, being a hospital is a, an exercise in discipline and, and in, um, in following a lot of rules and making sure you have solid culture and procedures that can be a place for, for doctors to help people get well. 
Um, so under Idaho rules, they do, they have a more specific definition, which is kind of typical, I think, of other rules when we really get into the regulatory. Um, first, it says a facility is 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 a, is a hospital is a facility that is primarily engaged in providing, and this is important by or under the daily supervision of physicians. So remember that term. Um, and then they talk about either medical or nursing care on a 24 hour basis for acute illness or diagnostic, diagnostic and therapeutic services for medical diagnosis and treatment, psychiatric, uh, rehabilitation services, or obstetrical care. So different types of care, but there's an but there's an important element to that, which is it's a it's a facility that's providing care, but it's by or under the daily supervision of physicians. So it also the Idaho rules puts a couple things that are important to kind of distinguish hospitals from other types of um, treatment or diagnostic facilities, and that is uh, B says provides for care of two or more individuals for 24 hours or or more consecutive hours, and is, sta is staffed to provide nursing care on a 24 hour basis. So basically overnight, um, you know, there's a lot of if if you're overnight. You're in a different category and you might be a hospital and you got to start looking at the definition now. Um, so, we're going to talk about the federal and state overlay here in just a 2nd, but it's important to understand that a hospital. Uh, again, let's look at the CMS. This last definition I have here CMS or the centers for Medicare and Medicaid services. The federal definition is a hospital is an institution primarily engaged in providing by or under the supervision of physicians, inpatient diagnostic and therapeutic services or rehabilitation services. So the one point I want to make that it's very important to understand is that a hospital provides a facility and an environment and staffing to help licensed providers provide care to patients and to help them get better. Now, so it's important to keep that dividing line in place. And I think the way I always think about it is just a hospital cannot go to medical school. A hospital cannot go to nursing school. A hospital cannot get a license to practice medicine. So um, a hospital can be licensed to be a facility to, to where those kind of licensed providers can, can provide the care, but, it, but a hospital itself cannot practice medicine. It is it is a place where where skilled and licensed and credentialed providers can provide care with a nursing staff and um, a staffing that can help them provide the care that they've been trained to provide. So it's important to keep that in mind, and, and we get into that a lot in the medical malpractice world, where um, of course any plaintiff wants to sue a hospital more than a physician because hospitals are bigger and. Um, but there's always this line that what is the hospital really responsible for versus what are the the um, trained physicians and providers licensed for and do, are doing. And it's important to keep that line in mind as we go through this. So a hospital is not a doctor. It's not a physician. It can't practice medicine. It can help. It can help the physicians and professionals practice medicine in a in a in a great way. But it can't practice medicine itself. So with that definition of a hospital, um, let's talk about the next level. When we talk about regulation of hospitals, it's um, it kind of goes back into um, American history and the difference between our state and federal governments. As you know, we were originally a collection of states. We became a federal government when we enacted the Constitution. The federal government for a long time had a more minor role in a lot of um, things that states regulate. And states were always the regulatory source uh, from the beginning, from the time of the colonies for things like welfare and for um, the, the helping the public. And so some things like things like um, licensing of healthcare and, and uh, providers was always a state function. So state, all the state states always had um, jurisdiction and authority over hospitals. Um, and over healthcare and doctors, and dentists, and and all kinds of healthcare, it was always considered a a, a local function, a state function, um, to to deal with healthcare. Um, that changed dramatically 
with um, the passage of Medicare in the 1960s and when Medicare came in and for, to provide uh, health insurance and um, health care for the more aged uh, and for people of advanced years uh, to take care of them uh, after employment-based employment, employment -based insurance would, would end, um, Medicare was put into place. It was put into place on a federal level um, with funding from the federal government and with the participation of the states, but it was put in at a federal level with federal, uh, with federal monies. And at that point, uh, the federal government gained a lot more jurisdiction over, over health care. So at, at this point, we have both state and federal overlays for the regulation of health care in the United States. So, for example, for states, you know, here in Idaho, for example, um, and in most states, you have hospital licensing. So to get to become a hospital, you have to go to the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare and get a license. And they have requirements and licensing standards that are very that are similar to this uh, the Medicare conditions of participation, but they are state based and they're passed by this our state regulators and our state legislators. And you get a license from the state of Idaho and you keep going back to the state of Idaho for that license for however many rooms or beds you're going to have. Now, there's another more intense level of regulation that has been is is very common across the United States, but not in Idaho or Utah, and that is what's called certificate of need. So for a long time, a lot of states had these statutes and regulatory um, mechanisms that decided whether a hospital was necessary or not uh, and would have to make a determination whether a community really needed another hospital. Um, a lot of states have backed away from that, including Idaho and Utah, but Montana and Nevada still have forms of certificate of need. So you can't just go build a hospital and, and ask for a license. You actually have to have permission to establish a new hospital. Um, the state also provides our, a lot of our patient safety and patient rights um, standards that you're used to dealing with, the ethical standards, consent, privacy, um, a lot of standards for um, what, um, what rights patients have. Um, we also have, uh, you just be aware, there's professional licensing, which is all the professionals working in the hospital need to be licensed, and that's usually under state law. So the physicians, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, they all are under state law with state regulatory authorities. So that's all under the state. Another important thing that's happened here recently in Idaho that Patrick's going to talk about is the Idaho Patient Act, which seems to be just an act that deals with billing, but in reality, it, it starts putting much more, um, it, it regulates hospitals in a significant way by making them, putting more responsibility on them for the billing of individual professionals which was always separate from, from hospital billing, and that line is being blurred and pushing more authority to the hospitals under the Idaho Patient Act. So Patrick will talk about that in a minute. Um, so under the federal, then you've got the other layer that you have to always keep in mind. So with regulation of hospitals, it's not that you're just under the state and it's not that you're just under the federal government. you got to consider these overlapping, we now have this overlapping jurisdiction. Now, that's not technically always true. There are some hospitals that have actually said no to all kinds of Medicare. And if you really could walk away from Medicare and not get any reimbursement from Medicare or Medicaid, uh, theoretically, you wouldn't have the same level of federal involvement. But most, most institutions cannot do that. And so most hospitals do take Medicare and then are subject to Medicare regulation. Medicare gets regula regulates mainly through what are called the conditions of participation, um, that we'll talk about in just a second, um, and through accreditation. So there's, you can show compliance, a hospital can show compliance uh, with the conditions of participation by surveys of accrediting bodies that are uh, sometimes often private bodies that um, have the ability to, to survey and make sure that hospitals stay compliant with the conditions of participation. Um, there's also just a broad area of regulation that's just regulation through reimbursement. So as anybody knows who's in healthcare, how you bill Medicare is very important, how you classify, how you code. And in that, inherent in that is a lot of regulation of healthcare. And we see a lot of movement 
in in directing healthcare through how reimbursement is being done. And anybody, most people involved with billing and, and uh, knows how that's pushing hospitals one direction or another in how they provide uh, services, what services they provide. Another very hot topic that we've had this last few weeks is the vaccine mandates. CMS uh, put out a mandate for vax that all staff at hospitals need to be uh, vaccinated. Um, the CMS felt it had the authority to do that because if hospitals wanted reimbursement, they would need to impose these mandates. Uh, a case was filed, uh, a couple of cases, several cases to challenge that and the judges at the district court level have said the CMS does not have that authority and that it's traditionally an area of state law and the CMS shouldn't uh, wander into that area. So that's a hot topic that's going on right now. There's other federal levels of regulation that we've talked, we're gonna talk about separately. HIPAA, there's going to be, a, uh, we're gonna have another presentation on health information privacy. Um, that's federal regulation that's very much controls us hospitals. Uh, EMTALA that Kelsey's gonna talk about in a moment. The Healthcare Quality Improvement Act of 1996 uh, really puts a lot of regulatory federal regulation on medical staff discipline. It's where you find the medical practitioner data bank, the national practitioner data bank, NPDB, where uh, physician discipline is recorded. Um, then of course you have Stark and anti-kickback laws, which we've talked about in another seminar. And of course you got federal employment laws um, uh, that uh, are very much in play that uh, hospitals have to keep an eye on. And of course, then you just have your normal local regulations that you're often dealing with for a city or municipality or county. Uh, the building permits to build a hospital, fire safety, land use, those kinds of things are, there's a big local overlay that often will have healthcare components too. So healthcare is a very regulated area at all levels, at the state level, the federal level, and even at the local level. And you have to keep all three levels in mind uh, throughout the time that you're you're working on that. Um, so the conditions of participation are pretty fundamental. When you look at them, it's essentially what you would expect um, you would want out of a hospital. This is essentially Medicare saying, look, if we're going to trust you with the care of these patients, we want to make sure that you are a good hospital and that you're doing the basics. So there's a condition of participation that says the hospital must be licensed by the state and that all the, all the physicians have to be licensed. There's a condition of participation uh, that you've got to have a medical staff uh, with bylaws and privileging and credentialing procedures. You've got to have certain institutions. You've got to have a governing board. You have to have a chief executive officer. Um, and importantly, the, all patients have to be under the care of a licensed physician. You can't, a hospital just can't have a patient that is not under the care of a licensed physician, which goes back to that fundamental definition that I talked about at the beginning. Hospitals are just places where physicians can provide care. And so accordingly, the condition of participation requires that patients uh, always be under the care of a licensed physician. And then there's individual requirements, um, the basic functions that you would expect. What's required of nursing services? medical records, pharmacies, radiological services, laboratories. What is What are the requirements on each of those? And each of those have a set of detailed rules for what they have to be. Um, the one big area that, you're, that practitioners and nurses are always dealing with um, from state regulation is, is patient rights. And under Idaho law, we have a set of patient rights. There's, there's gotta be a system for notifying patients of those rights. There's got to be um, informed consent. Uh, you've got to have respect the advanced directives. Um, there's patient safety rules. Patient, there's got to be patient grievance procedures. There's got to be procedures for restraint and seclusion. All of those are specified and and their standards provided under under the Idaho regulations. And uh, most staff are pretty well familiar with that as you go into the hospital and. There's always the notice of rights on every door and every bulletin board and and on a lot of the forms to make sure that those rights are always well communicated. So that is um, that's basically a very quick overview of how hospitals are regulated under state, federal, and local law. 
it's a, it can be, of course, there's much to that. All of that. I want to kind of, I wanted to give you that framework. So we're on the right on the right page. I'll turn now. I'll turn the time over to Kelsey. Thanks, Lee, and good morning, everybody. Um, I think that Imtala branches nicely off of the presentation that Lee just gave to everybody regarding hospitals, and we're getting a little bit more specific with the application of Imtala, which is <clears throat> the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which was enacted. Um, as part of COBRA initially, and this um, applies specifically to hospitals, but then even more specifically to emergency care, and we most often see this in an emergency department um, setting. And it applies whenever a hospital is receiving Medicare, Medicaid um, participation and funding and reimbursements. So those are some of the prerequisite qualifiers before um, EMTALA is even going to apply. But in general, um, EMTALA requires that hospitals provide um, medical screening examinations and stabilization of patients on a non-discriminatory matter. And non-discriminatory expands to even ability to pay and get pre-authorization for insurance. So we can't be turning away patients um, because they don't have an ability to pay. And as you can imagine, and you've probably experienced, that has sometimes caused um, consequences that wasn't necessarily intended by the act, but they've been very real. We're shifting the responsibility onto hospitals. The government is, is shifting that responsibility onto hospitals to provide for um, this non-discriminatory care. And, and um, it's required several hospitals to close because of the lack of receiving reimbursement for some of these, um, these services. So the EMTALA is often referred to as the anti-dumping law, and it's designed to prevent hospitals from transferring uninsured patients to public hospitals without, um, at a minimum, providing that medical screening exam and stabilization before transferring them. So EMTALA applies whenever an individual comes to the emergency department and the patient is entitled to receive a medical screening exam. And what we're looking for when we're providing that exam is to determine whether an emergency medical condition exists. And I provided a definition here that's been provided by CMS that gives some guidance on what a condition would be to be an emergency medical condition. Um, but really, we're we're assessing to see whether um, there's an emergent condition of the patient that would mandate the hospital to provide stabilization of that patient, meaning that you are reasonably sure that they can be transferred or discharged without clinical deterioration. And uh, the stabilizing the patient often requires other um, consultants and requires, as we'll see in a minute, the um, coordination with a receiving hospital sometimes when we're transferring a patient. And EMTALA would then apply to the receiving hospital as well. So it doesn't, um, we gotta make sure that we're being compliant with the um, EMTALA from the transferring facility as well as the receiving facility. So an example, uh, I put a couple of examples here that I thought we're insightful for seeing the scope of it. So if a pregnant woman with an emergency condition appears to the hospital, they must be um, treated until delivery is complete. If that you know, delivery is imminent, unless a transfer under the statute is appropriate. However, if there's an outpatient clinic um, that's hospital-based and they are not equipped to handle medical emergencies, then they're not obligated under EMTALA and they can simply refer patients to a nearby emergency department for care. So that initial assessment of whether the care is um, at an emergency department is, is critical in determining whether the EMTALA provisions apply. So um, if an emergency medical condition exists, then we cannot be delayed. Well, first of all, we cannot be delaying um, examination and treatment without 
because if there's no payment or pre-authorization of insurance. And then we have to ensure that we're providing stabilization and we're documenting that that medical screening examination was completed, stabilization was achieved, and then whether transfer to a higher level of care is needed, then uh, there's additional requirements under EMTALA that, that we consult with the receiving uh, hospital and make sure that they have the capacity and the level of care to provide for the patient that's going to be transferred. And for um, hospitals that are not accepting um, a patient for a high, higher level of care, it's really important that those types of reasons are being documented as well because the hospitals must be reporting to CMS or the state survey agency whenever there's reason to believe that there was a transfer that was improperly refused or a transfer was made while a patient was in, in an unstable condition. And uh, as a hospital, you can only be responsible for your side of the reporting. And we have to document as much as we can our, our contacts with the receiving um, hospital to make sure that we keep that record as accurate as possible, especially in the event of a later um, complaint that that transfer was improperly made or uh, refused. Um, so the transfer of patient care under EMTALA, the hospitals with specialized capabilities are obligated to accept the transfers from hospitals who lack the capacity to treat an unstable emergency medical condition. Um, so if, if the hospital, the receiving hospital has a higher level of care that the transferring hospital does not have, they are obligated under EMTALA to accept that patient provided that they have the, the resources to do so. Uh, there was a couple of examples here that I wanted to go over that um, implicate EMTALA. So if in the emergency department, um, we know that Dr. Jones from the nearby emergency um, department in the neighboring hospital took care of a patient at a prior visit, we can't just call that provider. If a physician is on call for the emergency room, the physician must come in when requested by the emergency room, even if it's for another doctor's patient. It's the hospital's um, obligation to ensure that emergency uh, care is being provided to patients for that medical screening exam. Um, another example that we see implicate quite a few other sub areas is the transferring physician is able to take care of the patient where he or she is, so there is no need to transfer. So as we talked about, uh, EMTALA applies when there's an emergent medical condition, but if the transferring physician, if the receiving um, hospital and the physician there is able to take care of the patient, we don't need a higher level of care, then EMTALA doesn't apply. And the hospital then must accept the patient if it has the capacity and capability to treat that patient. And if, a, but on a similar note, if that hospital determines that the patient should be transferred to a higher level of care, then that hospital shouldn't be second guessing the transferring hospital's current capacity and capability to treat the patient. If there is a concern for that, then the hospital should be documenting it, reporting it to hospital administration, and ultimately reporting that to the CMS survey. Um, something that I see a lot in the in the transferring of patients under EMTALA in my practice of uh, medical malpractice work is the the level of detail that's required for a transfer to actually take place and. There's a misconception often from the plaintiff's perspective that a transfer should be fast and it should happen expeditiously. And to a certain extent it does, but under EMTALA, we have the obligation to make these assessments and document these assessments of the medical screening exam, whether stabilization um, has been achieved and to confirm that we're not going to deteriorate the patient's med uh, medical condition by transferring them to another facility. And then we have to contact the receiving facility, document that we've uh, spoken with the right personnel. And if it's um, in a NICU, for example, have we talked to 
somebody within the NICU at a higher level of care to make sure that a baby is going to get that level of care at that hospital. And and then we have to get the corresponding medical records and we have to make sure that the receiving hospital is receiving the appropriate medical records. And a violation of any of these pieces of EMTALA can result in EMTALA violations. And we don't always see it necessarily in an EMTALA violation. We can see it in other um, civil causes of action, such as, you know, implicated in a medical malpractice setting or in a board licensure dispute. And they're not, they're not always correlative, but um, it's, it's important that under EMTALA, there doesn't have to be harm, so to speak. So in the, in a litigation case of personal injury, we have to say, okay, well, what's the harm? What's the damage? But in EMTALA, that doesn't, that piece is not required. Um, and there can be significant fines applied for a violation of EMTALA. And some of these examples of penalties include termination of the hospital or the physician's Medicare provider agreement. Obviously, that would be a pretty extreme um, penalty, but hospital fines up to around $105,000 per violation, um, physician fines up to $50,000 per violation, uh, receiving facility, if they have suffered financial loss as a result of another hospital's violation of EMTALA, then they may be able to bring a cause of action against the transferring hospital for recovery of those damages. Um, if there was an adverse patient outcome or an inadequate screening exam, then um, those are some of the private causes of actions that can come forward and be implicated in the EMTALA causes of action as well. Um, but importantly, there is no violation if a patient refuses an examination or treatment unless there's proof of coercion, but there will be a presumption that there is no coercion um, if we have documented the refusal, right? So we've got the documentation of the medical screening exam, the stabilization efforts, and similarly to the informed consent to provide care, it is critically important that we also document that refusal of care signed by the patient as well. So that, that's a pretty high level overview of EMTALA and I will pass the time over to Patrick. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Appreciate that. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'll be talking to you guys about the Auto Patients Act and the No Surprise Act. So first, let's talk about the Patients Act. Basically, the IPA provides a framework for other providers to follow before resorting to litigation. And the bill's chief supporter or main supporter of this legislation is Maluka CEO of Frank Vandersloot. If you visit the IPA's website, the very first thing you'll see on the website is a video of Mr. Vandersloot explaining the legislation, why he's supporting it. And then you will also see patient testimonials talking about the access of bills they've experienced with various med providers in the state. So, to preserve the right to file a lawsuit, not just a patient for unpaid medical debt, um, certain requirements need to be followed. For example, for instance, the healthcare provider must submit to the insurance claim um, the bill within four five days of that visit. So you, you want you want to ensure that you know you up to date with when the client came in, writing that in the notes, you know working with the nurses, um, the receptionist, ensuring that everything's been documented thoroughly. And then after that, after the initial visit, the healthcare provider must wait. 60 days um, to send the, the patient what they call 
uh, consolidated summary services. Basically in this CSS, you're talking about the search that are provided and the main, the main thing to think about in the CSS is that the provider, the hospital or any institution has to provide the client's name and information in the CSS, the name and information of the medical office or facility the patient visited, a list of services, charges, and other services that the patient received during the visit. And then just providing the client with an itemized list upon request if the client wants that. And and the one of the most notable changes here is that at the end of the bill of that CSS, you must you must state that this is not a final bill. Meaning that, hey, patient, we just want to be transparent here about your visit to the facility. Want to ensure that you know what we did, the service we pro provided you with. And now that this is not a final bill, therefore the CSS could contain language such as hey, this is not a bill. This is a summary of all the services you received. Um, please retain this for your record and contact your health insurance company or provider to determine the final amount that you might owe the facility. Then thirdly, after that, the health provider must provide what they call is a final statement. Basically, a final statement is essentially similar to what a CSS is, but the only difference in this statement is that the provider must provide the patient with the bill, with the information that was billed to the insurance company, the amounts paid, any balance that the patient might owe, and the final amount on the bottom as well, too. Following that, after that is done, the provider must wait an additional 90 days before they can take an extraordinary collection action. So you might have questions about what an ECA is. An ECA is basically when a provider or other healthcare facility sends the patient to um, collections for the debt or when they file a negative credit report against the patient, filing a lawsuit against the patient directly, or garnishing the bank accounts and wages, right? And I think in this situation, the bill system wants to tell that and ensure that the patient and the providers are being transparent about what is going on, what the patient can do to remedy the situation, or if, possible to just pay the bill without you know, receiving a ne negative credit report, without having to send the patient to collections or even filing a lawsuit against the patient. And the other thing you to note is that the IPA is also seeking to limit uh, the amount of attorney fees that one can receive you know, against the patient. For instance, in in a case that is contested, for in a case that is not contested, the maximum amount of money that can be awarded is awarded for attorney fees is three hundred fifty dollars. Right, so we're kind of limiting that amount. And then in a case that's contested, the maximum amount that a patient can receive, no, that can be awarded for attorney fees is seven hundred fifty dollars, I believe. Additionally, um, things to keep in mind here when it comes to providing clients with access to the CSS or final statements is that these information can be sent via email, a patient portal if the client gives consent, or just send it via mail first class. And this is kind of helps you know, to lower the costs um, that might be allocated to the hospitals, all the patients themselves. And I think that as the world becomes more globalized, we're all starting to use technology and therefore using sending information such as the CSS via, via email 
um, fishing portal can be much can can be easier and can save time for every, all the parties involved. Um, however, one of the cons about the IPA is that it might make collection agencies reluctant to take on medical debt against patients because they can't cover the cost and make a profit on the collection. Therefore, this seems to kind of negatively impact collection agencies and some aspects or to hospitals. And like, like Lee said at the beginning, you know, the IP is putting a lot of onus and authority on the hospitals to push um, these billing processes and ensuring that the hospitals and other facilities are working closely with the vendors when it comes to billing and being transparent with the patient about the services that are provided, the amount the patient might owe, you know, what was done, and ensuring that patients are not you know, receiving excessive amounts without knowing what is being charged, where, you know, where certain fees are coming from. Uh, the next one which I want to talk to you guys about is the No Surprises Act. And this is going to affect um, the new year, actually. The purpose here um, essentially is to protect patients from receiving surprise medical bills from emergency room services. Now, what is a surprise bill, essentially? In, in many cases, um, the provider can bill consumers for the difference between the provided bill and the amounts paid by the consumer's health care plan. Right? This, is, this is what we call balance billing. And when it comes to the patient or the client, this is called a surprise bill because the client doesn't know, you know the difference between the charge the provided bills and the amount the consumer's health care plan paid. And as a consumer, someone who generally you know, visits doctor's offices for you know, sports activities and physicals of that nature, you know, I'll get these bills. And sometimes I, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. I'm like, hey, wait, why don't we charge for X, Y, and Z? And the bills, you know, wants to mitigate that and ensure that patients are not paying excessive amounts out of pocket. And another thing to keep in mind here is that the No Surprises Act will only hold patients liable for their in network cost sharing amounts and require that the patient cannot exceed in network rates without. You know, discussing with the patient and getting the patient's consent in that nature. It will also ban certain out of network charges and balance billing without advance notice. Therefore, if you are a provider and you want to you know, charge out of network out of network rates and balance billing, you need to ensure that the client was given advance notice about the charges and in some in some aspects well to ensuring that the patient gave you consent. To do that. And then the other thing that the No Surprise Act requires is that facilities and other healthcare providers provide a plain language notice about um, receiving care out of network. Right again, here I think that the most critical aspect of this bill is about just transparency. I think transparency is the key here, is the provider. Or the healthcare facility working with the patient, being transparent with the patient about the bills, the costs, the rates, the charges, right? Because we, we don't want to you don't want to shock the clients with rates that they didn't adhere to prior to scheduling the visit. Next thing that the No Surprises Act requires is that the providers. Or oh, in other healthcare institutes out there, provide what we call a good faith estimate. This is basically providing the client or the patient with the expected charges that they will be receiving, and and also providing that good faith estimate to consumers that are insured in order for them to kind of allocate funds, figure out a way to pay for those fees without being shocked. Once to receive the bill, and then then you start, you know, being frantic about how they'll pay for the bill, figuring things out, and which 
would later lead to litigation, which would later lead to going to collection agency or receiving a negative report on the credit card information. Again, I think that this is critical and helpful in some capacity because patients are becoming more um, aware about the services that the providers are charging and it gives them time to allocate funds to figure out how they will pay for those you know, hospital bills that they will receive in the future. And the good faith estimate must be provided to the patient when the appointment is scheduled or upon the request, right? In this situation, we want to ensure that when you schedule an appointment with the client or patient, you've been transparent with them from the front end about the charges that we're receiving, about what's going on in the bill, about any rates that they, know, they might not know about as well too, just to ensure that everyone's on the same page and no one's being shocked by any fees, costs, or charges that weren't discussed at the appointment or when the client or patient requested that estimate. For instance, this, this is a good example right here. If a patient is getting surgery, obviously the cost of the surgery will be including the bill, any labs or tests, and any anesthesia that might be utilized during the operation. And we want to ensure that the client is given notice about this prior to going for surgery, just knowing what they can expect, what they'll be charged for, what, what they'll be billed for as well too in the process. And I also think this protects you know, the hospitals and other healthcare facilities, right? And promoting the notion that, hey, We've been transparent about the bill. We've talked to the client or patient about what was going to happen part of the appointment. We give them these notes about the service we're providing and who will be in the room and who will be doing X, Y, and Z during the operation, during the surgery, during the appointment that the patient has. And Another thing to keep in mind here that No Surprises Act provides timeframes of when the provider must provide the patient with the good faith estimate of the charges. And also keep in mind here that the good faith estimate must contain a list of services with specific, with specific details about what is going on, what happened, and you can also include the healthcare codes assigned to that service and the, expected and the expected charge that the client will receive at the end of the appointment or when everything is resorted with the provider. And there's different ways of providing this information to the patient. <clears throat> it could be done electronically. For example, it can be done via a patient portal. For example, a lot of hospitals nowadays have patient portals. I know that <clears throat> Primary Health does a good job of ensuring that their patients have access to the patient portal where they can access the records while it's done at the appointment. And it's easier that way, most, much more cost effective for the provider as opposed to constantly have to print papers, send mail to the client's house. If we can take that approach by having a patient portal, or if it's easier, you can just send it via mail paper works as well too, always works. And sometimes over the phone too, if that's easier for the uh, provider to utilize, a person can call, have a discussion about the charges, explaining what that appointment was about, what happened, and why they've been charged that. So I'm sure that patients will all have questions about and you know, why our hospital bills are, are so high, right? And so, <clears throat> having a transparent conversation with the patient and their doctor and their doctor about <clears throat> the estimates of the charges or whoever's in charge of that, explain that to the client. <clears throat> so the other things to know here about <clears throat> the Adult Patients Act is that 
patients, no, providers must discuss with their patients about their protections with their, their, their no surprise billing, right? I think here, again, it goes back to, we want to ensure that patients are not being <clears throat> um, surprised or shocked with certain bills or costs of the, of the appointment that they didn't know about, right? You don't want to charge a patient <clears throat> an excessive amount for something that you know, took like 30 minutes or an hour, basically just be transparent about the charge, about the services, I mean, I'm sorry. And then another important thing you have to keep in mind here that providers and hospitals should be aware of here is that the CMS will establish a process that allows patients to submit complaints about any violations to the downspilling process that they experience with the provider. Again, this is a very important to keep in mind because that could lead to litigation, other consequences. And so we want to just ensure that the provider is being transparent and upfront with the patient in order to protect themselves as well too in the future. And it will also create a consent process that allows patients to waive their balance protecting the balance bill protections and agree to out of network charges. Do I see that happening? I don't think that patients will be willing to waive their balance bill protections here, but I think that again, this bill seeks to protect patients directly from surprise bills and ensuring that and putting the onus on the providers that they're being transparent with their patients, clients about the bills they'll be receiving, what is going on in the billing process, when and when the patient wants that information for it to be readily available to them as soon as possible. Yeah, guys, I think that was a brief summary of the IPA and the No Surprises Act. Thank you guys for being here. Well, great job, Patrick. Thank you very much. Um, um, and again, Kelsey and Lee, thank to both of you um, for your insights and your comments today. Um, before we wrap up today, um, like I mentioned um, um, via the chat feature, um, if there are any questions, please feel free to submit them via chat. We've got a couple of minutes left. We'd be happy to address any questions that's on your mind. Um, while, while we're waiting for questions, Lee, um, any final thoughts on your end um, that you'd like to share with the, with the group? I think, uh, you know, going through all of this, I think everyone can see that uh, the nature of hospitals are evolving very quickly. We're, you know, they've been changing for many years, many decades, and they are, they continue to change. And um, I think you're seeing some efforts. You're seeing as as efforts at kind of unified healthcare reform doesn't really go very far um, because of the politics. And uh, the, the the issues um, you're seeing this kind of uh, kind of nibbling away at different issues like the Idaho Patient Act, uh, dealing with issues of uh, collections and and the difficulty on the billing side. You're seeing the No Surprises Act that's telling hospitals and providers how to explain their bills and how to document their bills. It deals with you know the out of network and in network. And you're seeing that I think the effect of a lot of that is to push more and more responsibility is onto the hospitals. And so you kind of see this slow um, evolve, you know, evolution of giving more power to the hospitals, even though the hospitals don't really want it. Um, that, you know, this isn't the hospitals trying to uh, grab more power, but if you if you require the hospitals to give consolidated statements of services like the Idaho Patient Act um, that pulls in all the information from other providers and other the physicians and the licensed professionals. If you have the No Surprises Act that that starts telling hospitals, you know, how to it, it really can is going to push networks and insurance coverage in a different direction and unify that more. You know, I, I think a lot of these have the effect of consolidating the industry, in healthcare, and hospitals in a way that. Um, is kind of a slow evolution 
but um, you know, by addressing these smaller, small, smaller issues, and I'm not sure that's wise policy, but that's that's where things are going. Um, we're addressing is it is it you know in states and the federal government we're we're addressing these these isolated issues instead of going to more integrated healthcare reform, and it it still does have the effect of changing what hospitals are and how they're being governed. And we'll continue to see that happen. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. I think that's a, a, a great um, um, summary and a, a great conclusion to today's presentation. I want to thank all of the participants who joined us for today's webinar. Um, we appreciate you being with us bright and early this morning. Um, I'd also like to extend a, a huge thanks to my colleagues, uh, Lee Radford, Kelsey Kirkham, and Patrick Galamulame for preparing today's information and uh, being a part of um, today's Fundamentals in Healthcare webinar. Um, by way of reminder, you will receive a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation and a link um, to today's recording so you can share with your colleagues and teams. And finally, our next webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, January 19th from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. And this webinar will focus on HIPAA privacy and security. Um, please keep your eyes peeled. You will, you will receive an invitation for uh, this particular presentation tomorrow. And with that, I wish all of you, um, your families, your colleagues, et cetera, um, a wonderful holiday season, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. And we look forward to seeing you on January 19th. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day.